Afghanistan is a country that's gone through a persistent drought that has taken its toll on the farmers, its economy, and food security. In a bid to find a solution to all this, the Taliban has decided to build what might be the largest artificial river in Asia, the Kashtepa Canal. We're talking about digging a trench about 177 miles long. Now, you may be wondering, how is something this massive being built? Where is this water coming from? What visionary engineering is being used? And most of all, how much of this mega project have they completed? All these questions will be answered within the video, so make sure you watch till the end. But before we continue, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more visionary builds worldwide. Of all the countries you'd expect to see a mega project, Afghanistan might just be the least likely. The nation's been nothing but a war wreck plagued with violence and poverty for more than 50 years. However, despite all the hardships, they've launched and built a mega project. Furthermore, they do this with zero foreign aid and no engineering advice from any other country. The Kashtepa Canal will be the world's longest and largest artificial irrigation canal. When completed, it'll be 177 miles long, 499 feet wide, and 28 feet deep. Afghanistan's decide to build this mega project in the northern part of their country, extending it from the Amu Darya River. The Kashtepa Canal will start in the province of Balkh and pass through the provinces of Jiaoxian before ending in Fariub. At the moment, the Kashtepa Canal is under construction. The contractors are working at a rather fast pace to complete it as soon as possible. And the main motivation for this is the growing water and food shortage crisis across the country. However, as much as this is a great project to help the people of Afghanistan, it has its opposition. For example, other countries that source their water from the Amu Darya River have complained that when the canal is complete, it'll affect their share of the river water. On the other hand, Afghanistan's assured them that such a thing will not happen. Nonetheless, it's the only country that doesn't really benefit from the river water, and thus, it's entitled to its share. To the people of Afghanistan, this canal is quite urgent. You see, this entire area has been more of an arid desert over the past few decades. This has mainly been caused by global warming, declining groundwater reservoirs, and a lack of sufficient irrigation systems. And so, when the canal is completed, an estimated 1 million Afghanis will benefit from the water. This will also enable thousands of farmers to return to agriculture, which will benefit the country. The Taliban plans to achieve this by dedicating 55,000 hectares of land to farms, focusing mainly on grains and wheat. In fact, the government's working towards being a wheat exporter by 2028. The project was initially launched in March 2022, and it's been progressing rather fast since then. It's set to take place in three phases. The first and second phases are where the digging of the canal takes place, while the third phase is the installation of water irrigation systems and other infrastructure. But you may be wondering, how is it that a country that's been plagued by war and drought is capable of funding such a mega project? The entire project's being managed by the Afghani National Development Corporation. As for the funding, it's fully funded by the government from tax revenues. The initial budget comes to a total of $500 million, but there's a possibility of adding an extra $100 million after recent reviews. However, with all these funds, Afghanistan's managed to sustain the project and make significant progress with it. This is despite having limited and rather old equipment and limited number of experienced engineers and no outside help. The Kashtepa Canal has been heavily criticized by people and media outlets. Most of them tried to highlight how the Kashtepa Canal is being built and the alleged mistakes, carelessness, and poor engineering methods used. However, when you do some research on your own, you'll realize that it's nothing like that. Before the government gave the green light on the entire project, intensive land surveying and soil studies have been conducted. It wasn't just a matter of sending diggers to carry out such complex operations in a random manner. With these studies, the government could ensure that water lifts were not needed, mainly because of associated costs, flood prevention during the winter, and soil compatibility. So to ensure this, they had to map out the canal on flat land with an elevation similar to that of the source area of the Amu Darya River. In addition, they had to ensure that the canal path was along the most fertile lands and in close proximity to towns and villages along the way. When the government decided on the canal path, they gave the work to 200 private contractors and spread them over 114 sections. This was the beginning of the first phase, which extends about 67 miles. More than 7,000 haul truck and excavator drivers were sent out along with project engineers. And to date, all these people are still working on the project. Not so long ago, they moved to phase two, which is a distance of 110 miles. Each contractor spreads their excavators in a line, making sure that there's enough space in between for the haul trucks to pass through. The trucks are then filled, and they all leave in an orderly manner to dump their loads in designated low elevation areas. The moment a set of excavators is done digging a section, it's reviewed by the engineers and supervisors. And when all looks good, they move on to the next section and repeat the process. 
As they do all this, they're guided by detailed maps and specifications. When construction of the canal began, the engineers had to build first 14 hydraulic gates, most of which were topped by a bridge for vehicles. These gates will come in handy in preventing floods during the winter and the heavy rainy periods, as well as when the Amudaria River levels rise. As the contractors went through the 114 sections, they made sure that each was separated from the other by a few feet of undug dirt. This helped them control the filling process and prevent soil displacement at the banks. This means that the sections were filled slowly. When the first section, which connects the Amudaria River to the canal, was completed, water was allowed to flow into it. After that, they progressively filled each section by removing the wide dirt walls they left between them. At this point, it's essential to note that the canal's floor and sides are all made of dirt, as the government decided not to use concrete slabs. But depending on which sources you read about this, this was both a good and bad idea. If you look at it objectively, the idea to not use concrete slabs has great advantages. For example, the lack of concrete slabs means that more eventual natural irrigation will take place to up to about 0.6 miles inland from the canal sides. In addition, there will be higher groundwater reservoir levels, which act as backup water sources when harsh drought kicks in. Apart from all that, there's the issue of money. Installing concrete slabs would have been devastatingly expensive, increasing the budget to more than $1 billion. And if it were to get there, Afghanistan wouldn't have been able to afford it. There were two concrete bridges that were constructed, one for the Hayratan Balk Highway and another for the railway. But when building these bridges, the Afghans kept it simple, using a solid reinforced concrete slab design. This mainly involved casting a C2 rather than a precast. To ensure they're done with most of the work, some parts of a major network of irrigation pipelines were also integrated with the completed phase one as well as the surrounding area. With these underground irrigation pipelines, farmers who are a few miles away will be able to access water from the canal. Furthermore, other water mains were installed to connect with water pumps in the nearby villages and towns. The canal is already serving its purpose, and those living near the completed phase one are already benefiting from this water. And now, as they work on phase two, more people and towns will benefit from it. Initially, the project was expected to be completed in 2028, but with the pace that the contractors are working at, it might just be completed earlier by a year or two. What do you think of the Koshtepa Canal? Do you think this visionary build will be successful in turning around the Afghan economy? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments below. And before you go, like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell icon for more visionary builds across the world. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.